What's up, y'all, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here, and we are so excited to share with y'all episode number two in the Bush podcast with Cole and Joel. Y'all, real quick, before the podcast starts, I've got to ask you to hit the follow button wherever you're listening to us, and please leave us a five-star review. We're a brand new podcast, and we're really trying to grow. That really helps us out in the algorithm of wherever you're listening. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you doing that and taking that little bit of time and really hope that you enjoy this episode of in the bush podcast in this episode we have nicole apalian nicole was such a great guest this episode is brought to you by learn hunt harvest and bush survival training.com you guys go check out our websites there you can also follow us on instagram at in the bush podcast you can also go to our, our personal instagrams which is cole wilkes hunter and joel v bushcraft Thanks so much, and y'all enjoy this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to In the Bush podcast with Cole and Joel. Man, oh man, Paul. You know, the first time you do anything, it's always a mess up. <laughs> and this time, we've had such technical, it's been an hour of messing around with computers and cables and all that sort of stuff. I guess that's not our strong point. But here we are with our first official guest, Nicole Apelian. Yay. It's <laughs> so nice to have you on. And thank you for the patience. You know, with all the nonsense that is. no worries. It just really solidifies. We all should really just be in the bush. <laughs> that is, that's so true. Oh, that's the truest thing I've heard this morning. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because the I don't think any of us are like sort of driven towards this technology, mm -mm. but there is an amazing opportunity if we learn to use some of it to be able to have people like yourself spread amazing stories and influence people in a positive way. So I kind of try and walk that fine line. We're right. Not, it's a great we, We're going to try and yeah. walk this fine line between, you know, living this, trying to express, express ourselves in that primitive way and then also embracing technology that can be utilized in a positive way. Yeah. And so here we go. Yeah. Cole, how are you feeling today, man? Man, I feel great, dude. It's, um, you know, this has been a long time coming. Joel and I have been talking about this, Nicole, for such a long time. And um, mm -hmm. so I don't know if you know, but Joel and I actually cast it together for season seven. Um, that's how Joel and I met was up in up in New York um, going to boot camp. So after after I bawled my eyes out, me and him just became um, long lost yeah. brothers. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's where the friendship really started. Yeah. So that was one of the blessings of my season of alone was to be able to meet Cole and form this relationship. Yeah. And it's just led us to this, you know, to many hunting experiences and now, you know, taking this deep, dark road down a podcasting, podcasting world. And um, it's so nice to have you. And yeah. It's so nice to be in your beautiful house. Thank you for inviting me around. And um, we'd love to just to dive deep. All right. And I know, I'm ready. I, I, know, I know you like to go deep, <laughs> but uh first things first um you know so nicole you obviously are probably known by by a lot of people as being on season it was season two and five right right okay of of alone but you know you're a herbalist you're an author you're a biologist an anthropologist um you also have taught a lot of wilderness uh, survival primitive skills and of course um i mean i cycle back to this author part i mean you've you, you're just writing books like crazy <laughs> <laughs> and you were just telling me about the um, the online course that you produced, which I'm very interested in. I know Leah, my wife, would also love to love to take a look at that. So I feel like with you, there is so many avenues we can go down. <laughs> and I kind of have a little rough idea of which avenue to go down. But I'd love you to to just give us a kind of in a nutshell the sort of the history of Nicole Apelian. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a big question. That's uh. a big question. Just, um, 
whatever you think is relevant. I'll nutshell it as best I can for you. How's that? Here's my elevator speech. Uh, <laughs> um, it's going to be a long elevator ride, but we'll do our best. Uh, so I grew up um, pretty feral. Uh, I mean, I lived and I grew up in Massachusetts. I mean, I was in oh, town. Right. I was in, yeah, I only, I moved to Oregon um, for graduate school in 91. That's what got me out here. So I've been here for a while. But um, my stepdad was really my biggest influence. You know, he would, he was a chemistry professor and he'd come home early from work and we'd go canoeing and we'd do a lot of camping in the summer and we'd always go somewhere and bring our field guides. And he really fostered my love of the outdoors just really well. And so I decided to go into biology. There was no question of what I was going to go into for, I did that for undergraduate and for one of my graduate degrees. And after I got, um, after I finished with that part of schooling, I, I moved, um, well, I moved all around. I did a lot of traveling and a lot of research, worked on the crab boats up in Alaska for a while in the Bering Sea. So you really excellent sea miles. Yeah, did some uh, research on the Exxon spill, um, invertebrate and algae research and traveled around the world and finally um, lived out of my bus for a long time in my 20s and finally decided uh, to join, join the Peace Corps. That's what first got me, well, to your, your area, neck of the woods, to Botswana. Okay. That's what took you to Africa. That's what first took me to Africa. I moved okay. there in 95 and was a game warden for the wildlife department there. Was that a, was that a big culture shock for you or not to? No, I'd always traveled. My dad's from overseas. I'm first generation. My dad's from Beirut, uh, Lebanon. And uh, so we would traveled a lot growing up. Um, I mean, it was a bit of a culture. It was a culture difference, that for sure. sure. But um, I, I just embraced it. I actually loved it over there. You know, with Peace Corps, it's nice because you go in and you're not there as an expat. You're there, you know, because you're not making a lot of money. You're meeting with yeah, those yeah. that do when they travel to they, other countries. They do. So you're not living behind a gated community. Yeah. Um, so you're living with people. You're learning the language. You learn. You live with a family at first in order to learn the language and get you get culture training. Um, mm-hmm. And then you make the same salary that someone would make who's local, which is kind of amazing for Peace Corps. I think it's a really good thing. So you live like local people do. And that really integrates you into the community. That's the best way to do it. It's the best way. Yeah. Was that kind of yeah. an eye opener for you? Kind of go in there and just, I mean, you know, just wage difference is, is huge. And, and everything about, you know, being there is probably a lot different. Yeah, it was. You know, I mean, before that, I wasn't making a lot of money anyway. I was, I was traveling. I was working up. <laughs> it worked like six months, make enough money to travel for six months and then do another research gig and make enough money to travel some more. So, and I was mostly living out of my Volkswagen bus during that period of time. It, it, it strikes me that you weren't going there for the money. No. You're going there <laughs> and, and yeah, I totally, I could totally relate. I did the same thing. I would go work at sea for like six months to a year and then go travel for five months. That's all I wanted to do was get the experiences. Exactly. And that was kind of my twenties. The, you, so you spent most of the time in Botswana. I know you went to South Africa, my, my sort of home country. I spent a lot of time there because after my Peace Corps gig ended, I joined, um, luckily I already had a master's in biology then. Mm. So I joined up with a lion research project and did that for a number of years. And so then I got, I really moved into the bush, you know, lived in the yeah. middle of nowhere. It was just myself and my research partner. You know, it was this in the 90s. We didn't even, I mean, we didn't have sat phones. We didn't have radio communications. We didn't even have radios which is kind of ridiculous. So oftentimes, you know, I'd be by myself probably six hours from the nearest person. No one knew where I was. I was in the parks and we were allowed to go places no one else was allowed to go. So it's not like <laughs> anyone would come along. Wow. You know, and I'm changing a flat tire next to, you know, a pride of lions or I'm, you know, or my, you know, have to, you know, my radiator goes out or I remember a time I was changing my leaf springs and I was by myself at our research camp and the high lift jack kicked out and it fell on me and luckily it landed like a <sighs> centimeter from my nose and I, but I had to dig myself out before nightfall because, you know, the hyenas had come. So there was a lot of that over that's, there. That's, that's the trick <laughs> is you don't want to be out there at night. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> you know, but if you have a car to sleep in, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Africa is very interesting like that. You have to have, you have to be resourceful. I'm yeah. sure that you, you learned that there. I mean, you, you just don't have a lot of the availability of all of the conveniences like you do in a first world country. So yeah, there was no safety net there. I think that's no the big thing, net. you know, going on a loan, there's a safety net. At least you have mm-hmm. someone to call. I mean, they're going to take them maybe three hours to get to you so it's yeah. not as good a safety net yeah. but out there if something happened no one would get to me you had to be completely self-sufficient completely self-sufficient absolutely yeah, yeah. that's amazing a, that's a you know <laughs> that, that's such a liberating feeling yeah. and it's so humbling 
Yeah. So how did you how did you get in with because you you I know that you spend time with the the San. Yes, I have Kalahari, a long standing right? community of San Bushmen in the Kalahari whom I've been working with for I don't know fifteen years or so, and uh, they're like second family to me. Um, and uh, I actually am working still working on a fifth. 14 year project on a mm. book of plant uses of the Kalahari <laughs> wow. line over there. They wow. actually had at, brought me aside and asked if um, this other woman and I would uh, write down their ethnobotanical knowledge because it was being lost. Yeah. And there was no written record of it. So we've been working on that for a long time. It's amazing how people are trying to extract and keep that knowledge alive and how in how how we get so influenced in the western world by them i mean cyber tracker right, right. i mean you've done some of the evalu evaluations it's, it's it's all derived from the sand yeah a way to um gain their knowledge and transfer it on yeah their knowledge and, is incredible being out so being out in the bush with them i mean when i was living, living in Botswana, especially at the lion research camp i mean that's where i learned what everyone kind of calls and survival skills, the soft skills, right? The soft skills. <laughs> the most important. <laughs> they are. Yes. Animal communication. Yeah. It's the sixth sense. It's bird language. I mean, that's the stuff oh, that keeps man. you alive. I'm going to sound like such a, like a, like a, I got the chills. I got the chills, Nicole. <laughs> right? They gave you the chills. Forget it because, these things. They're because the most those skills are the have. skills yeah. that we yeah. need to have. Yeah. Those are the ones you like, you like call. Hey, she's like, took the words out of my mouth, like the sixth sense. Yeah. You know, the, right. These are the things that really count. Yes. Because the when there's a lion fixing. in your camp, when there's a mamba in, as I've had, you know, in the winter, open up your bonnet and there's a mamba and the curled up on your engine block. I mean, these are things that like, yeah. you need to know the birds are going to tell you what's coming through your camp. 100%. And if you don't know that there, you're going to not make it because you're living yeah. in a different ecosystem. You're, you're part, literally part of that literally Ecosystem. part of it you know like i can absolutely relate from my years of spending time at the hudza and um they are an offshoot of each other they actually yes. do they connect way back but the when they when they're walking through the woods it's not a mindless stroll trying to get from a to b they're constantly in engagement with their surroundings yeah. like i'm sure you've witnessed with the sand they're looking at the ground and they're listening to the sounds. They're looking at the landscape and they, they read it in a way that we would read a book. Like they, yes. they just have this intimate relationship with it. And it's very clear to me that that is one of the biggest missing links. It is absolutely. For, for us in this modern because day. Because the other stuff you can learn, you can learn the hard skills. You can learn how to tan a hide. You can learn how to make fire by friction. You can learn how to build a shelter. But those skills, you have to have incredible amount of dirt time in order to gain those yep. skills. And those are the most important. So when I'm, you know, I'm walking through the bush with this community of Bushmen, and first of all, they're listening to like 12 different things at once. Yeah. And they all talk at once. I actually did my doctoral, my doctoral PhD dissertation work with two communities of Bush, of Monty Bushmen and Naro Bushmen. And to get people alone was really hard. But every, like when you're, when you're interviewing people and uh, when everyone is in yeah. groups, they'll all talk at once. And I can't distinguish what everyone's saying at once, right? It, it, usually we talk we take turns talking, take turns right? Talking, yeah. They all talk at once, but the yeah. thing is they can hear each other. Yeah. They can hear everything because they're so used to listening to every bird sound, everything mm -hmm. going on in the bush. They can hear it all at once. So it's not like talking over people. It's very different. Mm -hmm. And they always know where they are. Like I remember being, you know, not, a little turned around in the bush and you asked this. I remember asking my friend Uta, like, where, where are we? And yeah. he just points back to where we're going. And like, It's mind blowing. It's it, incredible. It took me a couple of visits to realize that, when we they 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 roam an enormous amount of territory mm -hmm. from, from the moment that they're born. Yeah. They get carried around through it, then they eventually start crawling through it, and then they eventually walk it, and then they hunt it. And they under, they know exactly where they are at all times. It's not like, oh, oh yeah, we're just gonna randomly go and hope to stumble into an antelope. No, no. We're gonna go down into that drawer because that's where the antelope live. Yeah. Like they know the land intimately. And, and that's such that that's a place, right? Not only did yeah. they grow up in it, but you know they're teaching. And I think that's one of the the real lessons I've learned from them from like um, over time is their their teaching style and their parenting style. I gotta mm. say, um, I uh, I remember being there once, and uh, one of my friends asked who was with me asked uh, one of this one of the guys Kakao. He asked him, you know, so how do you teach your children? And he said, well, we don't we don't teach our children. Our only job for our children is to love them. And 
we teach other people's children. We dip, discipline other people's children. But imagine that as a parent. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm a mom. I have three boys. Like, like, imagine not having to ever discipline or teach your child, but knowing they're going to be disciplined and taught. Right? Your only job is to love them. But there's other children, your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, cousins. Like, it's so much easier for kids to find a mentor who relates to them. Like, often they don't want to learn from their parents. So, and being able to, you know, teach those people something. Like, what a burden that could be lifted. We didn't have to live in that kind of community where you didn't have to do any of that except love your children. I've really tried to work that out in my life. Having a community that you can trust to to be like, if my yeah. if my child does step out of hand, that somebody else is going to hey, be be like, hey, look, that's not the way we do that here, and this is why. And and having like, you remember whenever your parents would tell you something, and you'd be like, I, I'm not listening to that thing you said, but you hear that same message from somebody else, and it transpired oh, like it, it connects with you, like right. It's right. just because it's coming through your parents. You're like, I'm not, I'm not listening to anything you're saying right now. But somebody yeah. else, it resonates with you because maybe it's an elder or something like that. So I think that's, you know, we've lost a lot of that community, that tribe, you know, that it, really it that it takes yeah. people yeah. to, yeah, it just, everything about it. Like that's, I mean, just, I mean, there's so many different rabbit holes we can go down with this because look at the way a lot of the kids are today. They're isolated by themselves in their rooms. There's no parents even involved, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's the, the terrible, terrible attitude of parents not wanting to be bothered by their kids. So right, just which I don't understand. Just hand off yeah. an iPad to them or yeah. push them over to the TV so that they can get back to doing what they need to do. And so, so this is actually one of the questions I was wanting to ask you is that tying all of this in, I know that we've probably had very similar experiences with, with spending time with these indigenous people and looking at and learning the lessons and having a profound impact on us by them. Then coming back into the modern day world and trying to implement some of those lessons into our lives. So yeah. as a mother, you got, is it two, two or three kids? I lost my oldest one 10 years ago. And so I have two kids right now. You got yeah. two, okay. Two kids, yeah, two boys. How do you, how do you influence them in that? How do you, is there any way that you can orchestrate or influence them in those lessons that you've learned? Yeah. You know, um, such a good question. Cause parenting, parenting nowadays is really difficult because we're not doing it in community. It's the and, hardest job I've, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. So one of the things I did is I did try to integrate a lot of community when the kids were growing up, which was great mm-hmm. when they were growing up. I mean, now we live pretty, we've been living fairly isolated for the last 10 years, Mm -hmm. but when they were little, we lived in a neighborhood and that was really great because they, you know, we're in and out of everybody's houses. We watched each other's kids. We helped each other out. Um, and I've been a single mom since Quinn was two and he's 16 now. So for 14 years, so it's been a long time. Um, and that's really difficult. (laughs) That's especially difficult, but also, um, you know, taking them to the gatherings, you know, when my kids were little, I was pretty broke. And uh, the gatherings, the skills gatherings I'm talking about, and for those who don't know, they're week-long survival skills or traditional skills gatherings where people gather together, instructors teach mm-hmm. for free, and it's the cheapest summer camp in town. It's about 300 it's, bucks to go, and you just learn from all these incredible instructors who are the best in their field. That's where we officially met. Yes, was at one of them. We but did. obviously we had the link of a loan, and yeah. we just hit it off straight away. <laughs> but um, yeah, as you say, I mean, when I saw these little kids running around just being able to be feral and just play with sticks and stones and then have a bunch of mentors um to instruct them in any which way with handling knives making fires i mean that is the closest that i have seen kids behaving like i've witnessed the hudza kids behaving in their community exactly and i've just they would go to you know five gatherings a year when the kids were growing up and that was about we'd always go early and we'd always stay late so probably two to three months of the year Mm -hmm. We were camping and at these gatherings and we, you know, I didn't we'd yank them from if they were in school at the time, we'd yank them from school and go to these because they learned so much more. So that was an integral part of raising them is them being able to go to these things, be very free and also have other adults around. Other mentors. Other mentors around and other kids to just, you know, run off with and get into trouble. I mean, even at, at home, you know, when the kids would do something. It was generally my middle, my middle one, Colton. Uh, he's still, he's <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, and he was doing something that was super risky, which they should be. I'd often just be like, you go do that. I just can't watch. That's which is really the best. Yeah. I think that's a really good parenting. That's really good parenting advice. Kids are supposed to be taking risks. 
There's yep. some, now kids can't even balance on things because they've, they've taken away, you know, the old types of playgrounds and made mm-hmm. them too safe. You know, kids should be climbing trees. They should be testing their limits. Yeah, they're going to get a little hurt now and then, but, you know, nothing major usually. I, I agree. I yeah. mean, I can't even comprehend, like when I was, Tal- Talon's now six, and uh, when I was five, I had a box of matches and a, and a pocket knife. Yeah. Grandfather gave me a pocket knife, and I, so my, my, parents, my parents had no problem with me walking around and making fires with, <laughs> yep. with matches. And I think about, you know, Talon, Talon does do it now. I'm sure, I know, Cole, we've talked about this, and you, the same thing, man, oh, yeah. running around and you know, in the woods and just uh, playing with, I guess, items that would be considered dangerous. Right. But yeah, I mean, risks were, were as human beings, risks are part of this human experience. If you don't learn how to manage risk, you're, you're not going to succeed in life. I mean, it's really important. I remember what kids and I, we were camping with some friends and, and a bunch of people I didn't know. It was like this big gathering, not a skills gathering uh, and by the river. And uh, it was a big rafting trip. And no one had made, it was getting dark and no one had made a fire. So my kids were three and seven at the time. Mm-hmm. So they started, they gather all the things, they things, they got the match, you know, they started, they made the fire and someone kid said, do you know your kids are playing with fire? <laughs> what is wrong with you? I said, yeah, because no one else did it. Good for them, you know? Yeah, you, you probably felt pride. <laughs> She's totally proud of them. Of course they should say you should make fire. Oh, that's the best thing you can do for your kids. Give them independence Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Especially when it comes to these ancient skills yeah you know like i always say like breaking rock you know making mm-hmm. stone tools shooting a bow and arrow making fire there is very few things that you can do that connect you with the essence of being a human being and exactly. those those a few of those things i know that when i do them and when others do them especially you know you and other the other people in part of the, the primitive skills community would attest to how invigorating and how connected we yeah. feel when we get to practice those ancient skills. It's one of the solutions to our modern life and what is it pe- causing anxiety and stress and depression for people. You know, you look at people doing an ancient skill, they're not unhappy mm. and they're not thinking about any other things. Now that comes back to the sort of circling around about lessons of learned from the Kalahari Bushmen. Yeah. You know, it's the power now is what it is. Mm-hmm. They live in- funny things that happened the day before and things like that around the campfire because it's funny um but you know yeah, and they want to laugh just living. like any other person <laughs> yeah, but they're living in the present moment and that's one of the things we've lost you know especially especially with time this is a this is a really just a short anecdote mm. um we were again like i don't know a decade or two ago and, and uh, we were with the Bushman, my friend John, John Young, actually. Oh, the John Young. Backer. Yeah, okay. he, he, he was there next, sitting next to me, and he pulled out this old pocket watch. I don't know. He said he didn't even know why he pulled it out. You know, he pulled it out, and he looked at it. And this guy, Hanama, who was one of my biggest mentors, said to him, is that a time piece? And John said, yeah. He says, oh, we don't like those. And John said, why don't you like those? And he said, because every time someone pulls out a time piece, the next thing you do is rude. And you know what it does? <sighs> you out of the present moment think of that you're having dinner with someone you've got a cell phone out you look at it you're not in that conversation anymore yeah. you're thinking about what you got to do or someone else isn't that truth right That's there yeah that now. is that is present. deep being present yeah being present yeah i i um i think i can speak on behalf of many different african tribes that i've been so fortunate to spend time with all of them mm-hmm. do not worry about the tomorrow and they live in the today always everyone gets always you know, yeah and the level of happiness that they encounter daily, it, it, it's just incredible how I mean, a lot of people wouldn't make sense to because they don't have much. Yeah. So they would wonder, like, how can these people be so content and how did, how do, why do they not suffer with any mental illness? And, and what, why? Well, because they're focusing on the now. Yeah. Family community that is everything to them absolutely everything because you know a real healthy culture it's connection to yourself connection to nature and it's a connection to others community and they have all of that in space i would love to hear your obviously anecdotal or um if you some research back stuff but i would love to hear your opinion on our relationship with nature this is obviously a big topic for people like us Mm -hmm. um and we are big advocates for getting close with nature and you hear a lot of things that come out like um you know uh, scientifically they're understanding that you know the smell of pine needles and you know all these things have like 
physical changes on our body. <laughs> now, this is something you're very good at. I mean, you have you have an apothecary, right? But I do. The, okay. Nicole's apothecary. Not Nicole's apothecary. apothecary. Your plant knowledge is incredible. Um, I've got two of your books, <laughs> which the way that they're laid out are incredible. Thank you. Um, I love how concise they are. Easy just to 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 locate the plant and see what that plant is good for the medicine, medicinal use. Um, I'd love you to talk a little bit about, you know, this relationship with nature, where you, how you think we're really meant to live with that connection to nature, anything that you're willing to share. I think that topic needs to be talked about more. It's an important topic because, you know, for most people, we're not going to be able to go back and live as hunter gatherers. I mean, it's just, it's not feasible, right? No. So we have to take the question of nature connection, which I think is hugely important in your daily life. And we have to integrate it into modern society because that is where we live. And that's very, that becomes more difficult, right? Because we have access so often mm. to our phones, to uh, the internet, to TV, to, you know, distractions that take us out of our present moment and really um, disconnect us from nature. And, you know, I use these things, right? Obviously, I write books, I'm on my computer, I, uh, you know, I use uh, social media as a great tool. Um, but you have to think of it as a tool and not as a daily way of living. And that's a good way to use technology. But coming away from that, mm. daily nature exposure is huge. And being able to live in nature or go camping or take time in nature or spend dirt time and really be outside is so connective. And that people really realize, I think, their true happiness when they get to do that kind of thing. When you get to really immerse yourself, as you and I have done, um, and you too, Cole, you know, like when you really are out there and immersing yourself and spending, you know, months in nature by yourself let's say or or with other people um it really like reawakens your primal dna mm, like, absolutely all of a sudden i remember being on alone <clears throat> and and i'd spent seven weeks by myself before that like i remember being on on alone the first time and you know um the hardest people i was asked like what's the hardest part about the show for me the hardest part was the transition home 100 percent. Yep. terrible you, know, you don't realize how much you're being exposed to and being bombarded with on a daily basis. You know, all of a sudden when I was out there, my primal brain was open. I could hear everything. My intuition was spot on. Yes. I mean, that's why I heard yeah. my son call me home. That's why I left on season one. I was had three meals in camp. I was super happy. I was only lost which, 10 pounds. Which was what, 60 or 70? How long were you out there for? On uh, season 57 one? 50, days. 57 days, yeah. which is a long time. A long in time. In that time, the level of connection that you form with that land Huge. is undeniable. Yeah, and I was still really happy. I felt like I had months to go. It was a pretty good, I was all, you know. Like, Your home. attitude always blew my mind because you were always so chipper. Like you you remind me a lot about of my mom because it, I don't think there's really anything that that could have been thrown your way that wasn't just like you just made the best of no matter what. I thought that was, was super awesome. Out there. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's, yeah, but to like, to your point about us not having that, like after you've been outside and your body's been touching the earth and nature all around you, it, it's seriously like something changes. And same thing like what Joel was getting to, like a lot of people want this one pill to fix their problems. And I honestly think that one pill is, mother nature and our you know our earth like it, it has everything that we need as long as you can gather the right things um and understand where to go to get those things like it really is a one pill it is you know that's a great point cole because yeah. that kind of brings us back to you know what is it about like how do you connect with nature right and there's different ways i mean just going for a, a walk out your back door great um spending you know real dirt time in nature great um, taking your kids out fishing, taking your kids out doing mm. something. But also, you know, you can connect to nature in other ways. Like I have a deep connection with nature because of herbal medicine. Mm. First of all, it saved yeah. my life. Well, I don't, would not be here talking to you now if I... Absolutely. And we, we'll get to that in a yeah. minute for sure. Yeah. If there wasn't about the power of herbal medicine. So that's a great connector. So one of my things I love to do and one of my sort of biggest passions through my books and my blogs and through workshops is connecting people to herbal medicine and wild foods so that that because it, it provides a way for you to go out into nature and have a little bit of a purpose of gathering of foraging of looking for things and um, and then you can share that with others or go out with groups 
And that is also good because that brings in community too. I mean, yes, we were on alone, but it's not the best way to live. I mean, I loved my time out there. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was a really broke single mom and, you know, really, it was really hard. And <laughs> being out in nature for two months was yeah. amazing. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wouldn't want that. Um, but <laughs> uh, I just have to say hallelujah to all this, man. This is, this is just fantastic. Um, you know, before we end the, so I don't want to get into all the ins and outs of the alone. You've probably, stopped, I know I have told so many times. Oh, yeah. No, no I, need. I'm just, there's one thing that I'm really interested in with all of the participants. I want to know mentally and spiritually what significant happen to you out there like mm -hmm. can you notice can you recall the noticeable changes that maybe happened to you spiritually and i'm not really too worried yeah. about physically yep no nope. two mentally things from day one till to the end so two things come to mind that are pretty clear so about 30 days in all of a sudden i realized that i had arrived and by what i mean by i had arrived <sighs> is that nothing the birds weren't weren't alarming for me anymore um there was this this mink whom I could barely see. I only saw its crab, little crab trail, and I could never see it. But I knew I'd arrived because I was sitting out. I remember this because it was actually not raining. There were only two days that it didn't rain all day there. Because, um, oh, you know, it's fall, That's winter. Tough. It was rough. Um, so it was, uh, I was sitting out on my sit spot, and I was eating something. I can't remember what. And uh, all of a sudden, this mink came up to me with its crab and sat like a foot from me ate its crab, looked at me, was really chill, and then slowly meandered off. With, and all of a with sudden... With a kind of body language telling you that he, he completely accepts you. Yes. And I knew that I had arrived. Mm. Like, nothing, bo nothing bothered. And the same happened with the bears. The male bear and I started foraging on the beach together, you know, 30 feet apart from each other. Um, and I remember one time I drowned one of the huge, really nice cameras. <laughs> it fell, the wind picked up and I was swimming in the water and it drowned. So they had to bring me another, like, yeah. you know, they're big no contact, but they had to bring me another one. And they pulled up towards the beach and they looked and then and the bear left because of them. And they're like, did you know there was a bear right there? And I'm thinking, I was like, yeah, we forage on this beach every like day. every day. Yeah. Like we're eating the same foods. We're, we're chill. We, we know each other, you know, and that's like animal communication. Because when I first got dropped, I did. There was a mom and cubs that I just put out the vibe of, I'm here in peace. Um, you know, there's everything is your babies are safe. And those bears never checked out my camp. Not never. They always check out your camp. Yeah. Always. always. They already knew. I already told them. I mean, people don't believe in animal communication, but your dog is at the door before, you know, before oh. they can see your car. Just as simple the as that. The only person that wouldn't believe in that is the person that hasn't had any of the experiences. Yeah. Like these experiences you're talking about, I mean, they almost, they well up, I just well up with emotion. It kind of, want to, wants to make me cry because mm. that level of relationship with the landscape is so important to us. Yeah. And we only get to have it in these fleeting moments. Like that moment you probably will think about for the rest of your life. Rest of my and, life. And yeah. wish to experience some of it again. Yeah. So that was, that was one of the big ones. And then the other one was, you know, toward towards the end, um, you know, when uh, when my son called me home, you know, I it was at the day the night of day fifty six, and I just it was like he picked up the phone and said, "Mom, I'm done. I need you home right now." Mm -hmm. And he was twelve at the time, and uh, and he was just staying with a friend did of that, mine. Did that come in as like just a strong energetic sense? Yes, yeah. But it was like he picked up the phone. And I heard it until so the next morning. I was like, "And I'm gone." Hmm. You know, I had no idea. Also, I had no idea that people were suffering. <laughs> like we hadn't yeah. seen season one yet, right? Yeah. I had no idea what was going on. I was just like, sorry, I gotta go. And uh, but that ex but through that experience that night I just stayed up late because I was thinking about things and I knew I was gonna be leaving and I really thought about the experience and what really, really keyed in is wow, like because I did some big trauma before that, you know, I'd been sick for a while and then mm. other things had happened in life and other things I won't go into, and then two years prior, they'd actually asked me for season one, and I'd said no, because oh. my son had uh, had passed a year before that, and I just didn't feel like I could either be alone or leave my kids yet, my other boys. So, um, this, as I said, if it's a good show and it flies, call me for season two. So uh, they did, and uh, but I got to that that point, and I realized, wow, like I've come through all this with peace and joy in my heart, mm -hmm. and that was 
that was a really big moment for me. Do you feel like that alone experience, which you probably didn't realize at the beginning, but maybe when you're in it or at the end of it or way after it, that that would have been the exact medicine you needed to heal from that loss? Yeah, I think it was big medicine. And we we uh, we had a cabin on the coast that we actually still have, and it's on 22 acres and really private and just really, it's a real nature cabin. Mm. And the kids and I spent most of that year after Bo passed at that cabin. We just, every every time, every chance we could get, we were there because we knew nature, I knew nature was healing. And that was a healing place for us. And uh, yeah, That's... we were just outside as much as we possibly could be. I commend you for knowing how to heal well how to heal at least parts of it because i i mean i can't imagine that losing a child ever goes away yeah no it doesn't you know you still do i still do with it, but anyway, yeah. you know you gotta figure out a way to come you, through that you have to come through you that have and, to. and you know i'm i'm a believer in the great spirit the almighty and i i have to believe that there is purpose in it you know, I, I, sometimes you don't know where the purpose is, what the meaning is, but I, I, there's an element of trust, I think, for me personally, that just has to be placed in there's a meaning there. Well, I've heard it too, um, that God only puts certain circumstances in your life that he knows you can deal with, right? So, And that's a good and bad. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point, because let's talk about that. So, I mean, that's just one one shadow you were officially diagnosed with ms multiple sclerosis yeah i understand that disease i think i did mention to you my aunt mm -hmm. had it she was my entire I, I i as long as i can remember she always had it she was completely debilitated by it yeah you, sitting in front of me here now i know you've been diagnosed for quite a while and i'd like you to talk a little bit about when you were diagnosed how long ago that was but when i look at you I mean, I don't know your age. It doesn't really matter. But when I look at you. I'm wicked old. Like 38, is, something like that. There, you're 54. Okay. <laughs> there is a vibrance to you. There is a vitality to you that radiates off you. Your skin complexion, the sparkle in your eyes. You are what I would, I would look at you not knowing you and be like, that's a healthy, that's a healthy adult female woman. Mm -hmm. Like you are the picture of health. Yeah. So you you got to you got to tell us when were you diagnosed how have you managed to deal with it because obviously to the untrained eye no one would notice that you have that disease. Right. Yeah, so I got diagnosed I got sick in 1999. I was 29. Oh wow, that's a okay, a yeah, long time. Ago. A long time ago. I got sick quickly and I got diagnosed at 30. Mm. Um finally I didn't know what was going on at first. My balance was off. I was really tired. I felt like I had the flu all the time, just like sheer exhaustion mm. um, and some weird pains, like shooting pains. And then finally, I lost my eyesight in my left eye. And that's what made me go in to see the neurologist. Mm. And uh, that's called optic neuritis. It's a very classic first sign of MS. And then I went in and had MRIs and they showed lesions on my brain. And, you know, I had a very easily diagnosable case of multiple sclerosis. I, I classic case. I went downhill super quickly. So I was super scared. I was 30. I was super sick my whole life ahead of me. And I was really, really scared. So I listened to my neurologist. <laughs> Bad idea. <Yeah. laughs> um, anyway, I listened to my neurologist. Well, well and... here's the question. What did they actually tell you to ex like what what would what expectations did they set for you? They didn't know at the time, but I went downhill quickly. I started losing the left side of my body. I mean, it came to the point where I couldn't even pick up a book. Like, with, like, or pick up this phone, like right next, next to me. Like I couldn't, I didn't have enough strength in my body. Yeah. I went from, um, I had to quit everything. I ended up quitting my job. I was teaching biology full time at the time. I quit my band. I quit pretty much everything. Mm. And uh, I uh, got, yeah, I would, started using a cane. And then I was in a wheelchair at night. And then I went to where most days I was bed bound. Jeez. Okay. Mm. So hold. So, For so three from, years. Three almost years. three years. Two and a half, three years. Gosh, I was not the person I am now. Were they trying? Were they? Were, were they feeding you a bunch of prescriptions and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. I was on medications. Gosh. I was on medication to counter medications. I was on daily injections, which reminded me every day that I was sick. Right? Nothing about giving yourself an injection every day, telling yourself I'm sick. I'm sick. Oh, I'm sick. Yeah, that right? mindset has got to be just destroying by itself. 
Like uh, without horrible. without all the pharmaceutical stuff on top of it. Yes. Well, there's no doubt that and... that mindset would cripple a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, let me back up. Not that mindset. That diagnosis would mentally cripple a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it would just be a down, downhill spiral probably for the rest of their life. Yeah. So how did you find that courage to break through that? Yeah, that's it. That's, and that's what it was. I had, so all of a sudden, you know, and, and I started losing my brain function, which was really my concentration. I couldn't concentrate on anything. I love my brain. <laughs> my favorite, favorite thing. We need one. We need it. <laughs> so I got to the point where I was just, I had no hope left. I was bed bound and I thought this quality of life, if this is my quality of life, like I don't want to live this. No. Yeah. So that was a big turning point for me. I was 32, um, super sick, and uh, finally just said, I need to change this. So my first step out was, you know, step by step. First step out was seeing an Ayurvedic physician who was a friend of ours and changing my diet. I mean, I've been gluten-free since then. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, changed my diet and started going on some, some herbs. And then I got my brain functioning enough. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a scientist. Like, I love Nothing I love better, and part of what I do in my work is deep diving into peer-reviewed academic research okay. and then reframing it for others and putting it out in a way that they could understand. Like, I love that. So that's what I did. I started deep diving into mostly research papers out of Asia. And that's when I discovered, you know, first of all, diet makes such a difference. Life, uh, mind-body connection, you know, doing daily, started doing daily gratitudes started doing yoga, things that I could, that I could gradually add on. And I slowly was starting to get a little better. And then finally, the last real um, sort of, I don't know, I want to say nail in the coffin because it's the opposite, right? It's yeah. the opposite. Would say. <laughs> light in the, I don't know, the, light the in the final, sky. The final nail out of the coffin. <laughs> was uh, herbal medicine. Yeah. And that's why I have such a passion for it. You know, reading about medicinal mushrooms and the things that they can do and how they're immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory. And like, this was not like everyone's talking about medicinal mushrooms now. Yeah. This is 25 years ago. No one was talking about this stuff then. And, and that... you know, Cole, me, you and I, we love our mushrooms. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes. Yes. This <laughs> this pod every single time. This podcast stemmed from uh, Joel and I sitting together, um, you know, and that's that's where a, a big part of this vision has come from. So, um, we actually, yeah, we actually had a distinct message um, in a in a in a mushroom ceremony that is psilocybin mushroom ceremony. Yeah. To to start a podcast, and so we're just obeying and we're trying it out. But I. I'm with you. Mushrooms yeah. are the most incredible, incredible things. And I use them daily. Yeah. And yes, now we're at the point where we can dive into this. Uh, <laughs> I want to get life. into this. Medicinal yes. mushrooms, medicinal plants, like this is your thing. This and this, thing. this, this, this podcast is, you know, bushcraft, hunting, you know, survival. This is, this is where we, the nuts and bolts of what we really want to, want to get into. Um, tell us about your favorite mushrooms to harvest and why? Yeah, well, the ones, the ones that I utilize every day um, are lion's mane because it actually increases nerve growth factor. So anyone mm -hmm. dealing with any sort of nervous system condition, it's incredible. It helps with gut inflammation. Um, so lion's mane mushroom is my number one. Reishi mushroom, um, I mean, it affects stress, cortisol levels, anxiety, hormonal balance, uh, the amount of, and all of them are immunomodulatory. Mm -hmm. All of them are immunomodulatory. All of them are antiviral. All of them do all these other things that are anti-inflammatory. Immunomodulatory? Yeah. So with MS or any other autoimmune disease, you can't have things like, like I can't take personally echinacea, astragalus, golden seal. They're too, they're immune boosting and they boost my immune system. So my autoimmune disease will kick back in. But there are certain medicinal mushrooms. Um, chaga is an exception. I can't, I personally can't do chaga because it is too boosting, but some people can. Um, but for me, the reishi, turkey tail, lion's mane, and cordyceps mushrooms, which I take in a dual extracted tincture form every day. And that's cool. important how you take it because just taking it in your tea, you're only getting water soluble sure. compounds. Sure. You're missing half yeah. the compounds. So that's why I make it in my apothecary is because the people can access like the dual extracted form that actually works for everything. Mm. You um, told me about this before. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell the listeners how you make the tincture, the dual, the, the double extracted you tinctures. Bet. So for my mushrooms and lichens, most of them 
need a dual extraction. And what all that simple is simply is, is extracting things in alcohol and separately extracting compounds in water. And the simple version of that is, you know, if you if you take anything, um, you know, it's all about chemistry, right? Mm. So if you're looking at what medicinal compounds are soluble in, you can't access them unless you can get them out of that mushroom, right? And a lot of people just by taking like a mushroom pill, et cetera, you know, that has to go through your gut. And most people in Western society, their guts, guts are messed up. Or a mess, yeah. yeah right. They've got leaky gut. They've got, you know, so much stems from the gut. And so they're not that actually more and able more. to extract those nutrients? Exactly. Mm. And a tincture form, you take it and you put it in your mouth and you actually absorbs it in four to five minutes into your bloodstream. So you get gotcha. all of the medicine. Wow. But to get that medicine, to access it, first I extract the mushrooms in alcohol for mm. two months. And oh, that, two months. And is that is that when you're doing the extraction, is that the whole fruiting body? Or it is you, the whole fruiting body. Okay, you don't yes. grind it up or anything. Yeah, well, I grind it up to oh, make do. it more more soluble, to make it to gotcha. have, increase the surface, surface area. area yeah. But it, I use fruiting body of the mushroom. Okay. So you grind that up, you extract it, alcohol, and that gets all the um, triterpenoids and all the steroids, all those things that steroidal hormones and things that don't come out in water. You can't access that in tea. So mushroom coffee is great, but you're missing all those. Mm. And then after that process, you can take that same, you can use the same fruiting bodies because you haven't actually accessed the other medicine yet. Oh, true. Because there are water-soluble compounds like the beta-glucans and the polysaccharides. Mm. That's all the anti-cancer stuff. Um, does other things too, but um, you can then you extract it in that, and then you mix it back at a ratio of three parts of the alcoholic extraction to one part of the water extraction. And there is your dual extracted tincture. Now, in my apothecary, I do another step called the spagyric method, which actually takes the minerals, burns them, and puts them back into it. So you also get the minerals of the mushroom. Mm. Most places don't do that, um, but I am able to do that in our apothecary. So it's a really a three-step three, three step process. And you can people can go online onto your website and purchase they can. these yep. features. Yeah. Awesome. What, what mushroom do you think has helped the most with MS? I think for me, reishi and lion's mane would okay. be the top two. I couldn't distinguish between. I, you know, I take all four every day because it's they're sure. so important. Yeah. Um, but those are the those are the top two. Would you? I mean, obviously, you've made a lot of lifestyle changes mm -hmm. to deal with the disease, and it's working extremely well. Do you think that the the medicinal aspect of the mushrooms is probably the has the biggest effect, or that and diet. And, uh, yeah. okay. and, you know, you can't really discount nature connection and the power yep. of the mind-body connection and the power of gratitude. Um, I have everything I do on a free blog on my website. So if someone goes on nicolapelli.com, they can look it up and see what I take daily um, just for access. But that really works for I mean, most of my, all my family, we're all taking medicinal mushrooms every day. Yeah. My, even, even my son, Quinn, who's 16, oh, he takes correct. lion's mane mushroom every day because of the nerve growth, you know, increasing his brain capacity, right? There's so, a tangible difference. Yes. To taking it. I mean, I'm going to sure. get to the point where people who are not microdosing and taking medicinal mushrooms mm -hmm. are going to be like losing out. With Zero or negative side effects. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So it's almost like one of those things, like, why wouldn't you take it? Because it, it's yeah. already, it does all this, like, and it, like, you don't have to have something for this to be beneficial to you guys. No, you don't. Right. And they actually affect everything it affects your gut it affects which like, everything stems from from depression and anxiety to many diseases that it helps your heart it helps your circulatory system it's helping your brain i mean there's nothing it's helping your hormonal balance it, it it's actually incredible in cordyceps a lot of people who are athletes take that because it increases mm. your your lung capacity oh, um yeah it, it, so all of those all of the medicinal mushrooms i have been a mushroom fortress and like I think everyone should be taking that every day, whether you're making it yourself, which I teach people how to make it themselves if you want to, or yeah. if you don't feel like it, you know, get it, buy it off the website, but you can make it yourself too. That's so cool. I think um, everyone should be taking those every day. There's no, nothing, there's no reason not to, and there's so many reasons to. So many reasons to. And then, you know, even just sort of the medicinal aspect aside, one of the most engaging family activities when Talon was super young, like mm -hmm. two years old, was to go mushroom hunting. Yes, it's so you fun. Know? And then especially when it's like you chanterelles and they're everywhere. I yeah. mean, they just run around like, I got one, daddy, and just loving it. Yeah. And it's such a great, fun way to get out and engage with nature, just like we've been talking about with the family. Yeah. And that's so important. That's a huge part of my healing, too, really. Nature. I mean, I was always connected with nature. Um, but, you know, the healing power of nature can't be underestimated. So question has to be asked yeah has the magic mushroom mm -hmm. psilocybin yeah. been a part of your practice mm -hmm. and has it have you have you noticed big benefits so i do that? yeah so i microdose 
a microdose psilocybin, yeah. um, which for those listening, whoever you, if they don't, if people, listeners don't know, when you microdose, um, you don't actually feel the effects. Yeah. Macrodosing is very different, as yeah. we all know. But for anyone listening, microdosing, you don't feel the effects, you don't notice it, but you might notice things like uh, decrease in anxiety, decrease in depression. Um, maybe a little more opening of the mind. And I pair it with lion's mane, as you're generally yeah. supposed to. I would, I would say enhanced focus, too. And enhanced focus, yeah. Okay. And so I do. I do. I have a microdose practice. Okay. Um, at the moment, I'm doing every other day. For a while, I was doing the Stamets Boron, did three off. Mm. You know, but you know, I heard him speak once, and, yeah. you know, he's like, you know how I came up with that? I made it up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I made it up. He said, so, so there's no real studies so that have been done yet. yet. Okay. Not yet. Yeah. So do what works for you. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I sometimes I do that. Sometimes I mix it up a little bit. Um, but it is an important part of my practice, um, personal practice. So I, I think microdosing is is fabulous. Um, I, I think it's um, absolutely one of the most useful tools that we could take advantage of in a time where mentally we are so challenged yeah. we're overstimulated we're stressed and here is what i think a sacred medicine that is for our use as human beings to enhance us yeah. and our relationship with others i mean hey cole when we when we hunt i mean microdosing has such a drastic um sort of it it, it, it really helps connect us to the hunt to the animal to that sixth sense that we've been talking about yeah it just hones us in. Yeah. Well, I think with a lot of us humans, like whenever we get out there, we're, we live such a fast paced life. I think what it does really, and, and just to clarify, Joel and I are out there tripping out and seeing things and stuff like that, right? This is, no. we're, it's on a minimal dose to where we, we can feel it come into our system, but it just gives us this attachment. It slows us down to the pace of nature. Like mm. we're, we're living today as human beings, if you're going into the city and you're going into town every day, it is so fast paced that when you step into nature and you try to move that fast pace, that's when, like when Nicole was talking about everything bumping and scaring and, and, you know, realizing that you're there when she finally slowed down and became accepted, like that's almost what the mushrooms do to you. It, your awareness mm -hmm. of everything around it gets in height. And and you can see and feel things that are going on that you probably normally wouldn't without it. Um, I mean, it's a huge yeah. benefit to to just slow you down and you're observant of everything that's going around, like the wind, yeah. the bugs, the bees, everything. Yeah, and I'd say for anyone listening who's like you know has fear around it because people do have fear around things that are new or or different, you know. Again, I'm a scientist. The science backs it up. It's the like, science backs it's it up. That's right. It up. Yeah. It absolutely does. Like, just to circle back what we were saying, like, there is there is very little um, reason to not, well, there there is reason. I mean, I do know anyone that has serious mental illness like schizophrenia and bipolar should stay clear of any psychedelic medicines. But apart from that, everyone else is good to go, from what I understand. But is that pretty accurate? Yeah, I mean, and but for people with anxiety and depression, it, it has made, I know some people who have been taking who from microdosing who had huge problems with that, and it has made a world I have met several. of difference. Yeah, I've met several. Same yeah. thing. And yeah. uh, particularly during the big, what some people call the heroic dose, yeah. know, three three grams upwards. Yeah, there's actually a great um, Netflix special on that that oh, talks about it. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Um, and uh, I think it's I think it's Paul's. I think it's Fantastic Fungi. Yep. Uh, oh, I've seen yeah. that. That's really just, good. That's really good. But also yeah. if you're, you know, if people are a little, I know it's not legal everywhere, et cetera, but the medicinal mushrooms also, like they're mm -hmm. legal. They've been researched. They have, you know, I don't know, 60 years of research behind them and they're really impactful. So they really are. Yeah. Mushrooms I, are our friend. <laughs> mu mushrooms are definitely our friend. Yeah. And so let's, uh, um, did you have any other? other uh, I, I do. So I, I wanted to go back just a second and, um, Nicole, you're talking about mind and body. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't, um, or I'll tell you what I believe, and then you can tell me what you think. Okay. Because I think our mind and our body is so able to repair and heal itself. If you have that mindset and just sitting down thinking that you are repairing yourself, your mind and body can physically do it. 
Do you yeah, believe so at all uh, any of that? I, I, I 100% believe that. So, you know, there's lots of studies. When people are told that they're sick, they get sicker, right? Right away. And right that's away. not hypochondria. That is your mind telling your body that you are indeed mm. sick. And that happened to me. I mean, I went downhill really fast. Um, and when I was trying to pull out of that, one of the biggest things that I did was doing gratitude, being in nature, keeping a positive attitude. I mean, even if your day is going really poorly, and we all have those days, like I think some people look at me and think, maybe she doesn't have those days. Oh, I have them. Like we all have them, Everyone right? Does. Everyone yeah. has that them. The human experience. Yes, it is. And even in the worst possible times, you can pull out a gratitude. You really can. And actually that giving thanks for something externally causes a huge internal shift. And there's been lots of research around this mm. and makes you healthier. I mean, even when my kids were little, I mean, we always do gratitudes around the dinner table. But, you know, when they were teenagers, sometimes, like, the gratitude were a little harder to pull out, like, ketchup, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you just got to roll with it. You got to roll with ketchup. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Then when you see them with other people yeah. doing gratitude, they're doing them right. Yeah. 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 It's so funny. <laughs> we do that in the evenings, too. Tell it'll be like, I'm grateful for Pokemon. And I'm like, oh, God, that's not what I was hoping for. Okay. <laughs> you got to take it. You got to take it. It's a good practice. Yes. And glad he's grateful for Pokemon, uh, you know? Yeah. It's well, okay. The point being that um, uh, creating that constant thought process of positive thinking. Of positive thinking. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, that was it always, it always, sorry. sorry it's Paul, okay. I, we, we have a little bit of a lag. Um, but uh, that's kind of where I was kind of going with that. Like, if you, like, could you just imagine if changing your mindset was to heal you? Like, that almost sounds ridiculous. But just have, <laughs> if, if you were to have a doctor that came in and told you that you had cancer and everything was going or whatever, and he lied to you and he told you everything is doing great. Just mm -hmm. keep up that strong mindset and believe that you're going to make it and you're fighting this and winning. And then the next day you did that and then you changed and you start doing exercises and you start eating good because you believed that it was making that difference yeah. and you healed yourself. Would that not be amazing? I mean, it just. Well, that happens. It, I mean, you look at the power the, the of. Placebo. Yeah. Placebo yes. effect, power of prayer, power of positive thinking. I mean, all of these have been shown, even you know, if you're in a hospital and there's a if, if you have a window versus not having a window, you heal faster. If you even have a picture of nature in the room, you heal faster. Yes. So obviously your mind is a powerful, powerful thing and it needs to be part of your daily practice. Yeah. It does. Positive thinking and yeah. giving, giving thanks. The, um, something that, that has to be asked because I, I have to, alone is an experience that is just unlike anything else. Um, the thing that alone and all my other time out in the woods, being alone on, on different experiences has done to me. And then you couple that with the time I've spent with the, with the Hadza in particular and with their families and really integrating with them is taking all those experiences, realizing what, we really do need as human beings. Mm -hmm. But then walking that fine line between wanting to practice and, and exhibit certain things in my lifestyle, but then being sort of slave to certain things in this modern world. Oh, it's the dilemma we all have. <laughs> so you have, so I, I'm assuming we probably have, all three of us I know have this, it's a fight. It's a constant fight to get through life in a way that we want to fit in with others because we want to have a partner. We want to have kids. We want our kids to go to school and have a community. We can't take them off into a cabin up in the middle of Alaska where there is no social interaction so that we can only eat wild food and only forage for all our food and fish and live a more a lifestyle closer to a hunter-gatherer. We, you 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 hit the nail on the head is that you, you, it's not feasible mm -hmm. it's not feasible if you want to have any sense of community right and you want to have kids that can actually have the choice of what what road they want to go down yeah. if you go and take them up into the middle of nowhere they're not going to know any better and they're going to be social um 
rejects. How do you manage? How do you manage to like walk that line each day? Well, that is such a small question. No. <laughs> Nothing like the big D. You said you were going deep. Here. Uh, we're going deep. All right. I can't tell you what. I'll give you a minute to think about it. And uh, I think what we should do is let's do a round table. I'll go first because I know we all have this dilemma. I My dilemma is that I'm looked at as feral mm. by a lot of people. And I know deep down inside me that that feral part, that wild part, that wolf is a part that I need to express yeah. in order to be a fulfilled human being, a man. I've got to do that. So I can't suppress it. And being out in the woods only allows me to release it. Mm -hmm. Hunting, tracking, you know, getting dirt on my hands, getting fire smoke all over my clothes and my hair, and just getting in it makes me feel alive. And yet in society, the surface level talk and the whole like niceties and the whole expectation of like, well, you've got to use this fork and this knife to eat this way. And you do this because, well, you're expected to, I don't conform to that. Yeah. Hmm. That doesn't speak to me. <laughs> the amount of times my kids weren't using utensils and said, <laughs> well, you didn't use utensils on the loan. Anyway, so exactly. many times. Well, <laughs> that's, that's the thing though, is that, is it that, I mean, we're, so that line of trying to fit in because at the end of the day, I've realized that I do want to fit in, in society. I do want to be accepted. I do want to have friendships. And I certainly want my wife and my son to, we, I want us to gel. I want us to be together and I want us to all have the freedom to live the kind of lives we want to live, but we also have to meet certain needs. Right. So that is my battle is to walk that daily line of how to find my time to be feral and then how to find the time to just suck it up and fit in. Ooh, the sucking it up and fitting in is hard. So that's, it's such, I mean, I think we're probably cool. Yeah. I, I mean, we're all I, going it through, is, right? it's so hard. Yeah. It's so hard to fit in whenever you're, whenever you're like us, y'all. It, because it just, you got to find your people. You, you do. You, you, people. you have to that's find true. your people and you kind of have to be malleable and put on face sometimes. You know what I mean? Because, there are those situations and those people that we're going to be around that we're just not going to click with. And it's just, you know, you can spot somebody like, like Joel and I, like all of us, I can already tell, like, we're going to have to meet and have do another podcast because it like, we are the same. We're cut from the same cloth. And whenever we get out there into those areas, like we're, you can spot us from a long ways away. Right. <laughs> yeah. Something a little bit different about this woman. <laughs> <laughs> But it is finding your people and finding people who will accept you for really who you are. Because I'm at the age, I really don't give a crap what anyone thinks about me at this point. Like, I am who I am. I like who I am. I'm going to say, I'm a little blunt. Um, I, <laughs> I tend to tell people what's on my mind, um, especially like my close friends and family, you know, and they're used to that. Um, I try to be, I mean, I'm nice. That's a good quality. But yeah. I am transparent, you know, I like to say what's on my mind. Do I always do that in public? No, that's none of their business. You know what I mean? I yeah. do that with people I love because that's where it matters. So I think the first step is really finding your people and making sure that those are the people that are going to bring out those best qualities in you too, because it is easy to get complacent, even if you're feral. The, I think I'm lucky that I don't suffer with any, with insecurities. Mm -hmm. Well, I do have it. Everyone's got insecurities. Oh yeah, I got them. <laughs> but but um, I feel like finding the right people that truly see see you for who you are and accept it and you can be yourself, your real authentic self, is the best way to get rid of any of those securities. Yeah. And just to know, as a human being, we are social. And I'm sure that you, you came to the same realization on alone that we love being alone, but we are designed to be social. And to have other people look at you and say, I accept you. I love you. You're my, you know, I, I adore you. I, whatever to have that gratification is we do want it. All of us, yeah. we all want it. So trying to get that from people in general, I think is something that we're all going to strive to do, but it's hard because when you kind of feral, like 
like us in a way there's a lot of people that are going to find you strange yeah you're going to find you strange and weird yeah and 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 unfortunately the thing is it's it's the majority yeah well yeah no yeah, i get you, that i really I do mean, I, I think i've found a way to walk that line pretty well okay um i don't know if i have great advice around it i think i just have you know, I've got my my deeply feral side, and I try to you know, go for my walk every morning and get out in nature. And you know, we spend the kids and I spend a lot of you know, God, growing up, we spend so much time outside. Um, and uh, but there, you know, I also, you know, well, I don't work for anybody else. So there's that. I run my own business. Okay. I write my own books. You know, I have my own things that I put out. I teach. You know, I do. I do whatever I want, really, whenever I want to, because I run it all myself. Um, which isn't always easier, but I don't wouldn't really want to be working for mm. someone else. Just personally, I like working for myself. I like making my own hours. I like taking a week off if I feel like, or if I really want to work through a weekend, which I tend not to. But if I no want, if I really need to get a project done, I can work on it and get it done, and then take time off whenever I want to. I like that freedom and flexibility, um, and uh, so that has been a big part of it is being able to have that. But also finding, yeah, finding your people. And not all my people are feral. I'd just like to say that. Yes. They don't have to be the same as you. Yes. I mean, my best friend whom you met this morning is, you know, is very, more, different. very different from me. Very different. Yeah. Um, but you know. somehow the collaboration, I can see how it works. But we love each other. Yeah. yeah, we're best friends. We love each other. And, you know, we all love together in this house, right? <laughs> <Which is kind laughs> he of no amazing. doubt accepts you for who you are. Yes. Even though he doesn't quite relate to that side of you, maybe. Exactly. But he accepts it. Yeah. Yes, and vice versa. And that's all we can ask for in in other human beings, right? Right. Is exactly. just you accept me, and I'll accept you. Mm -hmm. well, well, you don't have to be. Well, Joel, look at like a lot of the folks that attend our course. You know, our hunting course. Uh, they are nowhere near feral, but they are very like minded individuals, just like us. And and a lot of the thoughts and process and stuff like that, as far as humanity and you know love and all that stuff, is the same. But as the wild aspect of it is what's so different because it's so maybe it's uncomfortable for some people and they just don't they don't understand it because they've been kind of sheltered away from it from so long but then you take some of those people and you put them in our environment like you and i do with the course and strip them of their phone they have no service they can't do anything they're forced to be in this little community for a few days and that's why so many people are like oh you've changed my life because i didn't know like I, I think those things of being wild and feral are, are barbaric and, and, and we've, you know, we've, uh, yeah, we've moved out. Yeah. Of that. We've moved out of that. Right. It's where, civilized. where really when you look at <laughs> when you, yeah, but look at us, we're being feral is some of the most healthy ways of life period because of yeah. the way we, we go out and the experiences and the adventures that we have in the, tribulations and trials that we put ourselves in in the in the wild you know like we're out searching for that you hear so many people oh i gotta take a vacation from my vacation right well whenever we get through with a challenge or we get through with a loan or naked and afraid we can't wait to go back like what's yeah, that yeah. about what is that about well i think we all have that deep primal side and mm -hmm. accessing it really gives us joy Right. Yes. But circling back to the bigger question, right? Um, I think the key is is to find connect a, something that can connect you to whomever you're with. And this is mm. like, for example, mm. um, we met at the Rabbit Stick Skills Gathering, and yeah, most people go in there there for skills, right? But one of their rules, which I love, is no religion and no politics. Mm, yeah, right and if you people bring up religion and politics it's rock sticks and bones that's what you're supposed <laughs> to say rock yeah. sticks and bones right and i love that we don't talk about that there because that's not what it's about mm. it's not about what you believe or what you're doing yeah. or how whom you're going to vote for it's all about the skill so that's our connective practice there so i have made friends with people who are politically at the opposite end of the spectrum religiously you know we have very different beliefs mm. whatever what that is right and but it doesn't matter because now we've connected over something more important. We've connected over skills. So I think whatever that connective piece is you can find in other people mm. really can help draw us together. And honestly, that's what our nation needs right now because I don't want to go into that, but it, it's so messed up. Yeah. We are all all want the same things generally. Absolutely. Ninety percent of the stuff we all want 
They're the same. And to so your, let's to your point, we, we can, if we really look into it, you can connect with almost anyone. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to find what it is. You just but there will be, I mean, food. We all love food, right? Well, yeah. let's talk about food. Yeah. We'll connect over food. Yeah. Asking questions and listening helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And really listening. Yeah. Because I, I do feel like there's this tendency to be like people really want to be heard. And maybe that's a lot of insecurities, but the the moment that you're saying something, the person is then looking and thinking, how can I one up or how can I mm. respond in a way that I can interject my experience? Exactly. And Which I understand people want to be heard, but man, there's so much to be, there's so much to listen to. The older I get, the more I listen and the less I talk. You know, now I don't really talk about, I don't ever talk about loan experiences or these things. Like generally don't bring them up. Yeah. And I don't generally talk about them. I generally listen now because I, I learn when I listen. I don't learn when I'm here listening to myself talk. I really don't. I mean, I know this is a podcast interview, so it's a little bit of a different it's, format. It's, yeah. But in general, um, yeah, I try to listen. And the older I get, the more I listen. Well, that's wisdom. So not only do you possess wisdom, mm -hmm. but you possess, I mean, you're the whole package, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are what, I don't like this term. I, I find it like, with no disrespect, a very American term, but like, you're a badass. <laughs> oh, I like yeah. that term. I'll take yeah, I like better. badass. I think that fits. <laughs> and I feel like I'm an elder uh, now, too. You know, you, now you that I'm are. in my mid-50s and I'm getting there, you know, I feel I don't look like an elder sometimes, which kind of bothered me at times. Like, maybe I should be grayer or have more lines. I don't know. I'm pretty healthy. <laughs> but, uh, because I don't, I don't feel like I look my age. You, but, you definitely do not look. Um, yeah, which most I think most women be like, I don't look my age. But part of me wants to look my age because then like I'll be seen more as an elder. You know what I mean? Interesting. Yeah, and that just kind of shows how secure you are within yourself. Well, your personality is nowhere near fifty-four. That's part of the that's part of the issue. Is everybody sees you as that thirty-year-old that you act like? You're just so I'm joyful good. and freaking for real. Joyful. I mean, the glow about yeah. you is is like it comes across yeah. no matter what. Um, I think that's oh, super awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, in a in a world that is so um, dominated by males, and unfortunately, along the in my opinion, a lot of the kind of males that are should have no business setting any examples or being leaders. Um, it's so nice to um, come across a strong woman like yourself that I truly look at as being such an inspiration for all the young women out there. Thank you. I mean, you're so accomplished, capable. I mean, you've proved it. And yeah, your voice should be heard. Your experience should be told. And here we are. We're able to kind of take a little glimpse into it, eh, Cole? Thank uh, you both. <laughs> yeah, I, I was super excited whenever Joel, because this, this all kind of, you know, this came about pretty quick. Joel was like, I've got Nicole that she's ready to come on. And I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, I've been a huge fan because, uh, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Alone. And um, my mom's got one of your books. I think that's super cool. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there, you just, yeah, there's no limitations. It doesn't matter if you're if you're a woman or man or whatever. It's like your work ethic it took you to the places that you are now, right? And, and your dedication to your gift and your, your love and your passion. I think that's, that's such a great message for people, right? Like, look at where we are right now. We're here because this is what we love to do. And, and this is the path that's been laid down in front of us. And for you to be able to show that to so many people, like I have a daughter, I have a 16 year old daughter and like, absolutely. I would love if she came out to be something like Nicole Palin. It's, you know, who wouldn't want their daughter to, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, yeah, thank you so much for for doing this, and uh, you're just super humble. And I I am way too dumb, Nicole. I went to the eighth grade, <laughs> and I I it, it for real. I was like Joel, like this woman is got so much education, it like lifetimes compared to what I have. I'm gonna sound ridiculous asking some of the questions, but yeah, thank Somehow you. It's, it's somehow you pulled it off <laughs> it's yeah it's doing all, it's doing fine nature. how much yep. more basic and primal is that Absolutely. <laughs> yep. yeah whenever we got a minute i do have a question um from uh from some folks on facebook um if you wanted to touch on that real quick and then uh joel if you wanted to uh go from there um after that 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is J eight Kester five Oh five on, on Instagram. Um, so he asks, he says, what's the best mental health advice you both have, uh, for putting yourself to the most extreme challenge in one's life? I'm sure there's uh, fear and of course, maybe, uh, doubt. Um, but how do you overcome something like that? And, um, he says that he's a big fan and absolutely respects, uh, you know, everything that we do in, as far as alone and, and the challenges that we're on. Um, so yeah, mental how health. How do you prepare for a big challenge like that? If you want to get through it, how do you mentally prepare? Is that yes. the question? Yes, ma'am. I would say do it in baby steps. So I think the big answer for that, if you're going to do an outdoor challenge, the answer is dirt time. That's the biggest thing. And that all the dirt time is, is actually spending time outside. I mean, people mostly are spending time, you know, getting their gear ready and watching YouTube videos right. and doing those things. But there is no replacement for time spent on the ground. And if you want to start off, if you're nervous, do it in your backyard to start off. You know, do an overnight, do a two night challenge, you know, then go for a weekend challenge. And if you want to challenge yourself, you know, try doing it without, you know, having a phone as a back. I mean, turn it off, right? In mm -hmm. case you really have an emergency, but otherwise, you know, turn it off and try for, you know, keep adding a day and just see how that is. But there's no replacement for being outside and doing things yourself and failing, by the way. You know, when I teach a class, let's say I'm teaching a, I don't know, a figure four deadfall trap. If someone gets it right the first time, I'm bummed mm -hmm. because they'll never learn it. Yeah. It's the people who get yeah. it wrong, wrong and do it again and, and do go, it again and go do it go again until they get it. and then they know it. Yeah, every time they, you know, someone gets it right the first time in a class, I'm totally upset because they're never going to learn the darn thing. You have to fail. You have to be okay with failing over and over again. And, ad and then you adapt and you get more flexible and you learn more because those mistakes, if you learn from them, are what's going to then feed into you. Um, and so I think that's really important, um, being okay with failing. But, you know, you're failing on a minor scale. It's not like you're, you're, you're yeah. doing anything. You're either by yourself or you're with a buddy and you're outside, you're with a friend, and you guys can you know, camp together or whatever it is you're doing. Um, but do it, you know, do it in bit. But there's no replacement for just being on the ground and actively trying things. Mm. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I think that's such, such good advice. And, you know, like all, all of us are going to have bad experiences, challenging, fearful, intimidating experiences in life. And the more experience we gain in feeling those feelings, the better we'll be at handling them. Yeah. So it, it, if you put it into a practice, maybe daily or weekly, like maybe it's, you know, walking out in the snow right now. I mean, it just dumped a bunch of snow standing outside without a shirt on for five minutes. Can I do five minutes? Yeah. That, there's enough fear and discomfort in that alone to, to challenge you. Yeah. Discomfort is key. Is key. Yeah, you have to get used to being uncomfortable and being okay with being disruptive and be okay with having, yeah, being having discomfort in your life because that is going to breed. That's going to get you stronger. It's yeah. going to it's going to build character. It's going to yep. make you stronger. It's going to going to teach you about yourself. Yep. And uh, and that's the thing about this modern day world is that we have to seek a lot of these these experiences. So because comfortable, because right? So comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it ridiculous? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's yeah. a great question. Thank yeah, you that all. that's yeah. what I was uh, just to you know add to that. I think it, it's something that you can train, right? It's something mental yeah. toughness is something that you can train. You're not going to be able to just jump out there and go do 57 days without having some sort of a mental fortitude to to push you through that. And you yeah. already said that all the travel that you did and the places you went prepared you for that. So. My advice would be, y'all, if you're trying to build that mental toughness is, you know what, one day, don't turn that hot water on in the shower. Take that five, take that three minutes and, and deal with that. And then when you get through it, go do something else that is difficult and accomplish that and tell yourself that you can. And just all those things, once you believe you can, that's what mental toughness is, is believing that you can and then pushing yourself all the way to that goal. Yeah. 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 Sorry to interrupt, Joel. Um, Onward with your. No, we're. I think we're. We're. We've done really good for time. We've covered a lot. We've gone pretty deep. So I have one last question. All right. For our survivalists, bushcraft enthusiasts out there, what are five edible or medicinal plants that you absolutely have to know 
Well, when you're out in the field, I think the important thing is these are ones that like are kind of all around the world, right? Correct. So the number most, one is yeah. Yarrow. Yarrow is key. So Yarrow is what saved my finger. I, I didn't show it on the show. I cut my knuckle off on day 43 mm. and uh, it was really bad. But luckily the next two days were a huge storm. I actually couldn't leave my shelter. It was so, so um, windy out. And, and that's the trees the leaves, were falling. The leaves or the, or the flowers? The leaves are the flowers of yarrow plants. So luckily I'd collected them earlier in the season, so I had them dried. So yarrow stops bleeding almost immediately. Yeah. It stops external bleeding, or if you take it internally, it stops internal bleeding, which mm. is really important in the field. Wow. And it's antibacterial. So that is what saved my, my finger. That's incredible. Yep. The yarrow so, is your first one. First yeah. go-to. That's I've seen awesome. Yarrow, um, yeah. I've, I've seen yarrow heal a hematoma in, in 12 hours. Yeah. It's incredible plant. It's incredible. So that's one to know. Yeah. Number two, I would say, is plantain. Okay. A, it's now not the banana. It's the one that grows in a rosette on the ground. You'll see it. It's in everyone's lawn. Everyone tries to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's such a great, great weed. It'll push through anything. And uh, But it's good for any sort of, it draws things out. Mm -hmm. So if you get a, a sting, a bite, a snake bite, a splinter, anything like that, it, you can chew it up, put it right on your wound, and it will draw all that stuff out of it. It's also a great edible. I used to wrap my salmon yeah. in, in it and make little salmon tacos. Um, uh, yeah, plantain's a great, great edible. It's also really good for your gut because um, it, it draw, it's a drawing thing, right? Okay, so if you so take seeds and eat them, it'll just gotcha. draw, draw crap out of your so gut. So it'll draw the toxins out of your gut. It too. will. Ah, okay. Dandelion, because yeah. everyone knows it, right? Everyone knows dandelion. So research it a little more. Mm. The dandelion root's really good for your liver. Mm. You can roast it and make it into like a coffee substitute. Now, is that... Um... Can you harvest the root all year long? You can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I usually say harvest roots in fall, but you yeah. know, dandelions usually yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Um, they're they're prolific, right? Uh, and then you know you can the flowers. I fritter them up in the summer. I eat the eat the leaves. They're really healthy for you. Um, so that's a really good one because most people already know it. They're just not using it. They're not right? using it. Yeah. So just you know, don't take it from a sprayed lawn. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, the next one is usnea lichen because it's pretty much everywhere. Gotcha. And it, it looks, it's sometimes people think it's a moss because it hangs old from the man's, tree. Old man's beard. Old man's beard. That's how my son knows it. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so you know it's usnea if you pull it open yeah. and there's like a white little rubber band in the middle of it. Yeah. That's the key diagnostic. That one is, if I only had to pick like one medicine for the field, that would probably be it. Oh, really? Because it's antifungal. I know it's antibiotic. Um, yeah, like antibiotic, antifungal, antiviral, wow. and antimicrobial. So it does it, all. So it does it all. So I used to, for my water cache alone, I would cut up usnea and put it in it to keep it mm. keep it healthy, um, to make sure nothing was growing in it. Yeah. Um, that was also the second thing I used when, on on my wound. Right. Um, and it's a really great field dressing. Um, and it's just really good for yeah anything that ails you. <laughs> yeah. That's really good to know. And and we just just as we kind of get into the Cascade Mountains here in Central Oregon, it's it's everywhere. Yeah. And I mean Yarrow obviously is all year long. We can find it here in the high desert. Too. Exactly. And these are all across the United States and yeah. Canada. I mean, really across temperate zones, even in Mongolia, yeah. there was a URL. I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, fifth one, wow, there are so many. I mean, I really like elderberry because it's such a great antiviral and I yeah. have to use it every day. Um, just, yeah, elderberry is, my wife is huge with elderberry. Huge, it's great. Elderberry it's great. Tea, which uh, which ha does have to be cooked in order to, yes. you, you cannot eat it raw. No, you can tincture it, but you, you have to cook it okay. if, you're, if you're doing anything else with it or make an elderberry syrup or something like yeah. that. It's one of my favorites. Um, really delicious, but do cook it and uh, don't eat the leaves. <laughs> don't eat the leaves. So yeah. five fantastic um, resources there to go and check out and research. If um, for those of you that have never have gone down the the rabbit hole of medicinal plants, um, you definitely have some amazing resources. Um, Nicole's books. I've got the the herbal remedies book um, and the forages. Uh, what is the forages guide to guide wild, food. wild foods? Mm -hmm. um, uh, those are the two books I've got from yours, and they are fantastic. Thank you. The amount of plants that you cover is astounding. I'm working on a second edition of the herbal remedies book right now. It's oh. almost done. Um, I also have the holistic guide to wellness, which is herbal protocols, science based herbal protocols. And then my new wilderness uh, guide just came out. The wilderness guide, yes. It's all on my yeah. website. Uh, the the long term survival guide, fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. You've given me a couple copies here, so I'll definitely take those and read those. Um, well, y'all, it's been a good day in the bush. <laughs> great, great first episode with our first guest. Um, I think this turned out great, Joel. I think it was uh, pretty flawless after we got uh, some technical issues kind of worked out. Um, yeah, we worked through the kinks. 
Nicole. Yeah, hang out with Joel more. It was all good. Yeah. <laughs> we, got to, we got to know each other more exactly. and look forward to hanging out even more. Exactly. Yeah. We live near each other, so that's so great. I'll yeah. have to come <laughs> over whenever I come up. Um, Nicole, can you give everybody your social media and, and your website and all that and places to find sure. your books? Best place to find everything is on www.nicoleapelian, all one word, A-P-E-L-I-A-N.com. There's links to Nicole's Apothecary on there as well. If you want to check out my apothecary, or you can go to straight to Nicole'sApothecary.com. And my socials at Nicole Appellion. That's my Instagram. And I'm at Nicole Appellion Survival on Facebook. So, but my website has it all. So just go there and I've got a searchable blog if for something that ails you. It's all based in science and I'm, everything's very easy to find. Your website well, is amazing. Everyone. Yeah. Your website's amazing, Nicole. Thank your website's you. incredible. And don't forget the online course that she now offers. I'm very intrigued by that. Yeah, I have a new herbal e-course. There's a link from my main website on NicolePellion.com. You can go to it. And uh, it's a brand new herbal e-course. You can become an herbalist. It has, yeah. it's, it's, I really worked hard on it. Oh, and oh it's, that must take a And it's only 39 bucks. I made it really cheap. Oh, 39 bucks. Yeah, I looked at the same course. Someone else had a very similar, it was like $4,000. Oh, so my I wanted gosh. like lots of, I wanted everybody to access it. So yeah. yeah, it's linked from my website. It's an amazing class. I'm so proud of it. Good for you. Um, kitchen herbalism. Yeah. Awesome. Do it all Check it out, everyone. And if you have not, you know, if you didn't grasp that whole conversation, let me summarize it. Eat mushrooms and get out into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Right, brother. Nicole, Cole, yeah. Nicole, Cole, and Joel. Yeah. Ending the podcast. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Really appreciate it. Love you, brother. Thank you, too, dude. Love you, too. See ya.